All right. So let me first get my brain about me. Cool. So let's go back and let's talk about um, the very simple stuff that we started with. So let's talk about what a prefix and what a suffix is. So someone tell me what a prefix is. At the beginning. Yeah. Yeah. So if I were to tell you, um, we have a easy disease process. Let's do, let's do, do hematoma. What would be your prefix? Hema. Okay. And what does hema mean? Blood. Good. And then what would be the suffix? What is the suffix? Oma. The end. Yeah, the end. And then Oma means what? Oh, shoot. Now I know what that is. Take your time. Meningioma. Glioblastoma. Oh, I have it on myself. But I can't form the sense of the word. It's okay. It's okay. Anybody else? Tumor, tumor, mass. Very good. Yes. Oma, tumor mass. Uh, a meningioma would be in your head and the meninges. There's more to it, but that's the easy part. All right, so let's do it again, just so we got it. So let's do, mm, let's do, Let's do nephromegaly. What would be the prefix? Nef nephro. Okay, what does nephro mean? Kidney. And then megaly? Enlargement. Enlargement. And what would be megaly? Would it be the prefix or the suffix? If I give you nephromegaly. Yep. Suffix. Suffix, good. All right, one more, and I swear we'll be done. Uh, let's do rhinoplasty. Rhino is the um, prefix. And plasty is suffix. Rhino right. means nose. Plasty means what? Is it surgery or? Surgical repair. Yeah, good. Good. Okay. Very nice. Mm. Very nice. All right, make sure everyone's here. Yeah, I can hear myself echoing a little bit. Okay. So let's talk about uh, a post-surgical patient. Let's talk about a patient who has, a, let's say they have a crush injury, right? Or maybe they break something. So uh, they have to have a, a cast, right? Or a fixator of some sort. Right, so let's, let's fix this mute situation real quick. Let's see, I got one of them. I'm going to go ahead and mute you real quick. There we go. Did that help? Hold on, wait. There's a couple of you that are muted or not muted. There we go. I think we're good now. Okay. So when we have a patient who has this type of crush injury, what is our most immediate concern when we're talking about someone that has a break in an internal fixator or cast or something that's mobilizing um, this area? Pressure ulcers or skin breakdown. I like the way those areas are going. All right. So about the cast or about the fixator itself, what's what's my gravest concern for a patient that is a, a fresh post-op specific to that incident? Is it a DVT? Bleeding. I like DVT. I like concern with bleeding because they're post-surgical. Think about... The break in the crush itself. Think about the cast. What is my concern as a nurse when assessing that that arm, that leg, and that cast or that fixator? The swelling, perfusion, like yes. checking for pulse, swelling, checking for pulse. Yes. What do we check for pulse with? 
Doppler? Yeah, Doppler, very good. And then what would be a concern if I check the refill on the toe? And let's say that maybe um, maybe we had a knee repair from a sports injury, right? So if I check the toe, what would be the expected uh, result from checking the toe and pinching on it? I was checking for the cat refill. So, so it was less than three. It should be, but because it's swell, because he has surgery, would it be a little bit more? It would. Very good. So if it is less than three, that would be the expected to let me know that everything is fine. If my temperature is good, if my vitals are good, my blood pressure is fine. Um, I would expect some things like kind of a not so good smell in that area, but no skin breakdown. I would expect for someone to have some slothing of the skin, some itching, right? Because that would be new and there would be a significant amount of moisture that is redistributing in its own way. So those would be expected findings. What's not expected is a capillary refill that is extended beyond that limitation of that three seconds. So anything in excess of three, you know, four or five, whatever. Those are immediate concerns specific to the blood. What would be the problem? What do you think? Circulation. The cast being too tight. The cast is too tight. Good, good. We know the name of that bonus fine. Anybody? Was it circulation? Circulation is the issue, but there's a specific name for a cast that crushes too much. Mm -hmm. It has a specific name. Look it up. Give it a go. See if you can give it a Google. It's a bonus answer. It's an answer you're going to find in med surge and something you're going to need for your NCLEX and uh, for your exit has seen more than likely. It's a huge concern. See if you can find it while we're playing this game. Now, let's talk about the difference between uh, alert and uh, orientation or your ability to be alert and oriented is better. So tell me what it means for someone to be stuporous. Anybody at all? Yeah. You want to give it a go? What does it sound like? Stuporous. Like, kind of, it sounds like a drunken stupor. I like that. And what happens when, when a person's in a stupor? For all my Harry Potter fans, this is someone going stupefy. It's the same root, right? So it's the idea of, quite honestly, being silly, right? Frivolous. So when someone is stuporous, how would you expect them to act? Confused. Okay. Well, much like a person who might be walking sideways because they perhaps have been intoxicated, being stuporous is someone who requires a lot of stimuli that's painful, that hurts, and they might be there and present in the moment, um, but they're going to withdraw from that pain. But other than that, you can pretty much do whatever you want, and they're really not going to respond. Does that make sense? Now, how is that different from someone who is obtunded? Oh, I hear somebody talking, but I can't quite hear them. It's the opposite. So define what that means, if you can. And I, I know where you're doing, and I like where you're going. This is exactly where you need to go. Just keep going. So if, if stupor is is they're requiring stimuli, then the opposite would mean that they need less of it. Okay, I like that. So let me explain obtunded a little bit. Obtunded is a little bizarre. 
it's the I like to call it it's the person who isn't used to waking up early in the morning so I'm an early morning person some people are not those people make me laugh because you can shake them and they're like ah fine five minutes left and then they go right back to sleep they're there you got to poke them but they're a little more difficult right they'll they'll talk to you mid-sentence they'll answer your question and they're going to go right back to sleep does that make sense Yes. yes now tell me what lethargic is not able to wake them like extra yeah. extra yeah. difficult to wake okay difficult to arouse. so like, lethargic I'll is somebody that i can literally just tap them or say their name and they'll wake up really mm-hmm Mm -hmm. I thought they would be like, um, like a, a little like confused, but so they wake up. I, I don't know. So here's how it goes. It goes lethargic is like tap, tap. Hey, honey, you need to wake up and take your pills. Okay, fine. Okay, cool. Then obtunded, which is, hey, honey. Hi. 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 I need for you to wake up. I don't want to do it. Honey, I need, but I need for you to wake up. Come on. Come on. Come on. Pinch, pinch. Love you. Come on. Rawr, 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 rawr. okay fine all right fine so then we get into stuporous which is i really can't even walk straight and um i can basically pinch you really hard and you're gonna just basically do this and that lets me know that you're in there and you're withdrawing from the pain and then the worst is like semi-comatose and then of course comatose and semi-comatose is um I require incredibly painful stimuli. Um, I respond with abnormal flexion, abnormal extension. It's very, when I think of these patients, I think of patients who are in a seizure, right? Because they have that irregular extension and flexion. I'm going to give them painful stimuli and, and I'm not expecting to get much in return other than this abnormal flexion and extension. Does that make sense? And then comatosis, there's just nothing. I got nothing, literally nothing. Does that make sense? Okay. So there's like layers. So the easiest layer is lethargic and that's tap, tap. Love you. Hey, you gotta wake up, take pills. Okay, cool. And then you got the grumpy, like I've had this husband for 45 years, that guy, like, that's what I think of when I think of the word obtunded. And usually I think of a gentleman who I theoretically have been married to for 45 years. And I would imagine that they're like the size of Henry the eighth, because I'm from the South and I cook well. So obtunded, he would be a ton of pounds, which would give him apnea, which means he would be sleepy while I tried to wake him because of his apnea. That's kind of how I remembered that. I don't know if that helps. That might be too much. Does that help at all? Yeah, that does. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, cool. You guys know I always have a thing, right? That's my thing for that one. I don't know that it's perfect, but it's there. All right. So let's move into pain. Chronic versus uh, acute pain. So first off, what's the difference in time frame? Acute is sudden and chronic is like continuous or years. past 12 weeks over time. Past 12 weeks. That's good. And then uh, give me a chronic condition. Cancer. That's been going on. Um, yeah. Fibromyalgia. What was that? Fibromyalgia. Fibromyalgia. I thought you said bipolar melon. I was like, what is that? I got to check that out right now. Yeah, absolutely. Fibromyalgia is a big deal. Um, so then tell me something that would be an acute form of pain. Um, abdominal surgery. Oh, like that a just took place. Joint pain. Yeah, all those things. And then can I technically have acute on chronic pain? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So I can have a uh, a knee injury from sports and then I can have an acute pain because I twisted it the wrong way, right? 
So then tell me what the difference between chronic pain, what's the difference in uh, pain rating versus acute pain? Which one is stronger? To acute. Acute is stronger. Acute is always going to be stronger, most certainly. So then when I have a patient with chronic pain and I have a patient who has acute pain, the patient who perceives that pain, even though it's the same pain, who's going to perceive that differently and why? Well, the answer is both, but who's going to perceive that pain as less than and why? Chronic because they're used to it. I love that for you. Good. Perfect. All right. So um, let's talk about patients who are post-surgical for a second. When I have a post-surgical patient and let's say that I have a wound and it could be anything, we could, we could make it a hemicrany, whatever. Um, so we've got a hemicrany and I've got, I don't know, staples, sutures. Those things sound accurate, right? Or I have a flap, a bone flap, and it's, it's been stapled over, whatever. With that surgical wound, tell me what I'm looking at as a nurse and tell me why that's important. Can you, I'm sorry, can you say that one more time? Sure. I have a patient who has a, a brain wound, right? We had a, we had a hemicrany. We, we had to take a piece of the brain out and we have a skin flap back over it and we are letting it heal itself. And we have staples and, um, and sutures and things of that nature. Nothing big. When I get this patient post-surgical, um, what am I looking for? What am I assessing? What am I expecting to see after a couple of days? Uh, as far as healing is concerned. Do you want to make sure it's not swelling? Yeah. Is it healing correctly? Any drainage, odor? Give it to me. Different color? Bad color? Yes. I'm checking for redness. I'm checking for swelling. I'm checking for edema. I'm checking for all the crazy things, right? What would we, we're always going to check this wound. Do we ever leave this wound for surgery to check? Mm. No, maybe no. we have a leave this room for surgery to check. So if it is a fresh wound and surgery has never opened that wound, who opens mm. that wound first? The doctor. The surgery always opens their first wound. You never touch the first one. After that, though, whose job is it? The nurse. Yep. Until that patient is gone, we're checking that wound and assessing it constantly because we know how fragile those are. So very good. That was a whole lot that we just, mm -hmm. very good. Make sure that you're checking for the serious things. Is it hot? Is it red? Is there pus coming out of it? Is there ooey gooey's, things of that nature? Good. Very good. All right. Um, hmm. Tell me about a person who is wearing any type of respiratory cannula, be it a nasal cannula, a non-rebreather, anything of that nature. A specific though to nasal cannulas, what am I concerned with as far as pressure? Tell me what pieces and parts I would need to double verify and double check specific to a nasal cannula. Like check that like the placement that it's placed correctly. Yeah, I mean, what's the problem with nasal cannulas and elderly people? What's the trend? Um, skin breakdown. Yeah, mm -hmm. for sure. So then, where is that skin going to break down based off of where that cannula is placed? The ears. Very good. So we got to check for pressure behind here. What is this called? This little buddy right here. Those are called the helixes. So we got to check behind there. Those things are really, really good about getting really nasty pressure spots on them. Think about it. They sit right here. They pull things out. They sit on top sometimes. Sometimes people wiggle them. Where else? The face. Where else? The, um, in the front of the face. Yeah, yeah. In the front of the face. Good, good. Anywhere else? In the, the nose. 
And the nose and the nostrils. Yeah. It's going to be potentially very red, nasty around here. If you get a person that gets really dry up under their nose, we would then ask respiratory to give us a container of uh, like water. And that sterile water, when it mixes with uh, the oxygen, it gives like a cool mist so that a person doesn't bleed through their nose, which is really nice. So yeah, we want to inspect and make sure that they have good respiratory effort when we give them things like oxygen. We want to measure what? What's the most important vital sign if I'm giving somebody a nasal cannula? Oxygen saturation. Thank you. Oxygen saturation. I need to make sure there's no pressure areas behind here, behind here. Perfect. Mm, let's see. Now, let's talk about post-surgical patients that are specific to, uh, let's say that they have a trach, okay? So what's a tracheostomy? Tell me what that is first. Tube in the throat to help you breathe. I'll take that as gospel. Okay, good. So when we have a tracheostomy, and it's brand new. What are we gonna what are we gonna be concerned with specific to a brand new trick? Hogging. Oh, they're breathing. Oh, they're breathing, yeah, for sure. So what do we make sure that we never ever 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 take out? The trick. Why? The whole because it'll thing. close up. I know, like an earring, right? Same diff, mm -hmm. only it's in your throat and that's the only way you're breathing. Yikes, that's a bad day. Perfect, okay. Um, what else do we need to watch specifically to a brand new tracheostomy? Think about what we talked about earlier. Infection? Yeah, for sure. What are signs of infection? Swelling. Redness, swelling. Swelling, redness. Remember, uh, this is in their neck. It's in their throat. Guess what we do? We move our head around and we look at things all day. What does that do to fresh skin that hasn't been used to being split open? Well, it tears and it bumps and it rips as we move about. I remember um, my, my slit on way down here that I have. Uh, I remember for the first time of having that repaired and I put my head back to wash my hair, I felt like my neck was going to open up and I had never felt that sensation before. So it was quite alarming. Right. And I did it two or three more times on accident. It feels like your whole like head's just going to flop off. <laughs> so like if, if we need to make sure that we inspect that skin, because it is quite fragile and any bit of a split or a pop will cause a, a potential for it to be infected. So that's wonderful that you guys need to watch out for it. Perfect. All right, so let's talk about post-surgical wounds that are colostomies. What am I concerned with with a post-surgical colostomy? Dehydration. Cool, I like that. I wasn't expecting that answer. Totally plausible, totally divine. I love that for you. All right, tell me about the skin. Um, skin, like irritation, infection again, like irritation, redness, breakdown, bad color of that stoma. It should Purple. be red. Should be pinkish red, should be shiny and moist. I don't know why females have a problem with that word. It is what it is. All right. Also, if it's purple, what does that mean? Infection. Uh, is something's clogged or something like I like the answer to that that is an absolute answer dig a little bit deeper though you almost got this what's clogged lacking blue blood flow blood yeah flow. thank you yeah. so brown black dry crusty dead okay dark red purple moist getting dead trying to go dead or it might be trauma Either way, we have to say something about it because it doesn't look good, right? Um, if it's white and dry, also dead. Uh, that whole entire top layer is gone. If you tap it and it doesn't blant, yeah, it's 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 a done deal. We want pinkish red. We want it shiny and, and beautiful, okay? What are some other problems that we are going to run into related to a fresh colostomy? Mm 
with skin breakdown skin breakdown sure what would uh what would we also run into from a mental perspective oh they they would be devastated confused like why is this here yep i like that answer of all that said everything for me that was perfect very good we need to think about the mental capacity we need to explain to them you can't have a life past this we need to educate them on how to change things for themselves um and what kind of method would we use when we're teaching someone how to do something um i let them accident huh i literally said half of the answer on accident (laughs) will we let them demonstrate Mm mm-hmm we call that a teach back method yep very good now let's play a game of venus versus arterial okay so i am a person that i complain of leg pain okay i have swollen feet all right when i go back to bed though my leg pain, it kind of goes away. It gets better. So what's my condition? Is it arterial or is it venous? The arterial. I don't know. Venous. Why is it venous? Come on. You got this. Why is it venous? Can I get blood back to the heart? Very good. So when we lay down flat, what are we essentially doing? Even in everything else. That that's it. We're redistributing things. So what we do is we take the pressure off of that and then our leg pain magically goes away. All right. So here's what I need for you to do. I need for you to put on one side V for venous, A for arterial. All right. Now, if you like horoscopes or planets, you can also do V for venous. A for arterial, which is Aries, which is easy to remember because it's literally love and war. Okay. And then also we have that funny song, the I'm your Venus, I'm your fire. It's, it's, it just makes sense to me to do it that way, but you can compartmentalize it however you want to. So Venus, I want you to think like a Venusian. I want you to think like a lady. We care about our legs. Our little variscosities bother us. Right. And what's our biggest problem? We're constantly on our feet. All right. Now this is different from arterial. Arterial reminds me of artillery, which reminds me of Aries and war, because when you're dealing with the arteries, you're in constant pain. Why? The lack of oxygen. I in the lack of oxygen in the what? In the what? being like throughout the body and the arteries like i know what you're doing with that i know what you're doing can i let me let me help you here what Mm -hmm. i'm understanding and what i'm getting from you and knowing you like i know you what i think you're trying to say is in the arteries this is a circulatory issue because it's pinched and because we don't get adequate blood flow it's constant pain because it's like constantly attacking itself and that's absolutely accurate so when we deal with arteries attack arterial war aries these things red arteries when we think of these things um how do we correct the problem of having arterial insufficiency what is our recommendation is that usually like catheterizations or Catheterizations are very good. What do we do before we do invasive procedures? What's the therapy recommendation? For venous, it's going to be kick your legs up. Would we recommend that for arterial? Um, Is it just... Would it just be like, you know, the... Would you compress it? The legs, the the, um, things on your leg, the kind of... Okay, everybody stop. Here's how we do this. Mm -hmm. Venus is blue, right? Venus is beautiful. We're going to think of ladies and Venus. All right. We're going to think of arteries and we're going to think of red over here. All right. So for V and Venus, 
Variscosities are the problem, varicose veins. Okay. When you deal with varicose veins, do we want to wear Ted hose for varicose veins for, for venous issues? Yeah. Yes. With Ted hose, do we want to, do we want to lift our legs up in the air and raise them and elevate them above our, our heart level? Yes. Yes. We certainly do. Do we want to take frequent breaks? Yes. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. I think that the problem is, is you're, you're answering exactly how I wanted to. I think that I asked the question wrong. And I feel like now that I'm asking this question so much simpler, it's, it's easier. So I apologize. All right. So venous variscosities, what's the procedure for venous issues besides all of the things we've mentioned? Is there something we can do physically to, uh, to the variscosity itself? Can we zap the lady veins? Yes. Yes, we can zap the lady veins. Okay. All right. Arterial. Arterial is basically the opposite. We don't want to compress it because the problem is what? Already compression, right? Because something's kinked, something's coiled, or something's squeezing too much. All right. So it's a, it's a more circulation issue versus being squeezed in because of too much fluid and you got to kick your legs up. So this is solely a, an insufficiency from an arterial standpoint, much huger deal for a lot of reasons. Arterial, do not compress anything. They have to walk and move. Taking breaks is going to make it hurt worse. Now, remember when we talked about the two different types of arterial issues, right? What were the ones where there was one that was very painful and you had to walk through it? And then there's one where you can walk for a while and it doesn't hurt at first, but after a couple of blocks, it does hurt and you have to completely stop and then you can resume. Do you remember what it was called? Nope. This would have been from exam number two. Okay. Crickets all the way. All right. Don't worry about it. Arterial main things. You have to walk. You have to move. All right. That's the recommendation. You have claudication issues. Remember claudication? Yes. It's not familiar. Okay. There was intermittent claudication and there was full on claudication. Which one's intermittent claudication do you think? Knowing the word intermittent means you can walk mm -hmm. yep and then once it becomes so painful you have to stop you take a break and then you're able to resume now full-on claudication they're not able to do those things it's just an absolute misery the whole way through and that's basically your entire base of knowledge for venous versus arterial okay and you guys are doing great so let me give you some scenarios about communication. As a nurse, would I tell a patient, I got a trope for you because we think you might have an MI? No. Why? Uh, is that the doctor's job? No, we would tell we would tell them those things. It's rude. You're telling them, but you're not explaining what's going on. Yes, very good. What the heck is an MI? What the heck is a trope? Right? So the problem is, is we're not clearly identifying what it is that we're doing. So we want to make sure that while we're communicating, the take home message is that we are having them understand a medical standpoint, medical terminology from a very base level. So we would not promote acronyms like, I don't know. Uh, I know would be one that would be like, huh, what, who, uh, or four gram diet. Like what the heck is a four gram diet? No, nobody knows that a, a two grams of cardiac and the four grams are regular, right? It's just not a thing. So understand that you just need to articulate those things appropriately. Um, during the communication process is the biggest, biggest thing. Uh, do we use closed ended questions or open ended questions? Here's another example of communication. Open ended. 
Okay, cool. So tell me uh, a good example of an open-ended question. They they explain, like you ask them a question and they explain like where the problem is. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Go on to debt with it, I suppose. Is that what that is? I like that. So if I were to tell you, did you get your flu shot this year? Is that open-ended or closed-ended? Close. Close. Close, yeah. I'm not getting anywhere because case closed because they didn't told me, right? What about how are you feeling today? Open. 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 Wide open. Because that could just go in any direction. All right, good. I think we got that. Subjective versus objective. Tell me the difference. Subjective is what the patient says. Objective is measurable, seeable. Nice, nice. What if I say the patient's 88 years old? That's subjective. Uh, subjective. Objective. Object. So here's how I do this. Subjective is the subject, aka my patient, and anything that comes out of her mouth from her bump in her gums. All right, mm -hmm. because it's subjectively probably inaccurate, if I'm honest. Why? Because they don't understand what we do objective is i can objectively say that that is 100 percent accurate aka they're 88 aka their last weight was 138 pounds right um versus subjective which is i haven't slept in weeks really like you had to physically sleep mm -hmm. and you'd be dead right so that's mm -hmm. so. all right uh let's do, 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 do let's go to basic skills let's talk about Oh, let's talk about blood pressures. Oh, that drives me insane in the membrane. First off, blood pressures. Where does the blood pressure line go? There's a line on your blood pressure cuff. What is that line for? Um, I, don't I heard artery. Where does the artery line go? The middle. Of the brachial area in the front forearm, the bendable part. So I hear that the artery line goes on the artery, correct? Mm -hmm. That's amazing. Yes. I'm very happy for that. Perfect. <laughs> so glad. Thank you. All right. So tell me about some problems that I could have related to blood pressure, related to improper blood pressure cuffs. It can give you an inaccurate reading. Very good. And then give me some examples of blood pressure mistakes that can give me inaccurate readings. Cuff uh, wrong size cuff for the uh, wrong size arm. Cuff too, it's too, too big, too small. Their legs could be crossed. Too tight, too loose. Okay. What if my arm is like this? Mm -mm, inaccurate. That would go bad. Okay. So what is it when... um? Because I actually just had a patient the other day and I was getting his blood pressure and I got his blood pressure on his right arm and it was on the lower side. I got it on the left side and it was high. So if I'm honest, that could either be a potential for a subclavian issue that's a big deal or operator error um, and okay. a whole bunch in between. So I probably wouldn't sweat the small stuff unless it was a big variant, but we'll get into that later. That's a, that's, that's a dicey that I have like 9,000 more questions to go with that statement. I love you guys. So listen, little known fact about, about, uh, uh people in advanced practice, whatever that looks like, you know, be it, uh, a advanced nurse practitioner, a, a PA, NP, a doc, whatever. Like if you guys give us two bits of information, we're just like, seriously, that's all. And you want me to make a big assumption on that? Like, there's a lot more variants, but I am curious because uh, the first place I go is to that little subclavian issue, which is interesting. So we'll talk about it later. Um, if I deflate a cuff too rapidly, is that going to potentiate me having a bad blood pressure? Yes. How? Well, if it you're you wouldn't accurately be able to like the millimeters of mercury and from like what you're seeing and what you're hearing, if it's, you're not going to get a correct reading. Or maybe right? trying to get a correct reading. Is that so what it is? Is yeah. that going to make it too falsely high or too falsely low? Um, 
Probably. Low. High. It's actually too low. Deflating a blood pressure cuff too too fast what it does is it uh it causes it to show it's too falsely too low because it rapidly deflates it and doesn't give uh, a, an accurate assumption right so if you have a cuff that's too narrow for a patient's arm it's going to go too high if you have um a cuff that is wrapped too loosely it could potentiate other issues, right? If you reinflate it over and over, or you like hit it and then just let it dial, just go like, just didn't take forever. Again, you're going to potentiate it to be too high. However, if you deflate it and you just go, Zzz, then it's going to be too low, right? So as long as you understand the two highs versus two lows, life is peachy and keen. And it sounds like you guys got it just fine. All right. Um, Please understand that sometimes these questions are going to come up multiple occasions. The question might tell you specifically three, specifically name four occurrences where this happens. Please understand that you are absolutely going to lose that question. If it says pick three, which is in bold and cap, so it's screaming at you and it's doing it very, very angrily. Please make sure that you don't under or over with that. Um, it's a big deal because you're automatically going to miss it. I know that sounds silly. There were 19 instances where that happened and I have mentioned it several times and it keeps happening. So just please watch out for that. There's some of you guys they need to get a really good grade because, you know, things happen, right? So that's, if that would be my biggest recommendation for this exam, that would be, would be my biggest hint and hack. Um, now let's talk about assessing someone's heart rate. How would you assess a heart rate? I know that sounds silly. Check their pulse. All right, cool. Do we notice anything while we're checking the pulse? Like um, if it's abnormal, or like arrhythmia. Yeah. So fill the pulse and notice the rhythm, right? Perfect. Now, if I'm going to assess specifically any type of constriction or mu movement, um, without accommodation and I am doing just pupillary constriction itself. Tell me what cranial nerve that is. If you can you repeat it again. Yeah. If I am doing assessing just the pupillary constriction, not accommodation, not any, I mean, three, is it three? It's three. What's number three? Ocular motor. Ocular, ocular motor. Very good. What's two? It's optic. Optic. And it's Snell and chart. Snell and chart. Very good. Love it. Uh, let me give you another one. Oh, this will be fun. Give me number six. Abduces and your, what is it? The six Henley? I can never pronounce it. Six signal. I don't know, but I know. That's the worst six points of gaze ever, by the way, but that's okay. perfect. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Well, uh, it's number four. That's the hardest one. Try trichochlear. Procochlear. Is it trochochlear? Trochlear. Trochlear. Right. Tomato, tomato, whatever. I'm proud of you guys. I couldn't be more excited for you. All right. So when we're talking about peripheral vision, is that two or three? You said, oh, is it three? Three. 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 Remember horse blinders. How many blinders do I get? Two. Oh, okay. Uh, okay. I told you I got a hack for everything. Well, nearly everything. All right, let's see. What is the most important, guys? Listen, I should never give an answer to a test ever because it's totally cheating. 
However, in nursing, there is one question I can ask you, and it's never cheating. You know why? Because it is the most basic nursing question that you're going to be asked for the rest of your life. So here you go. You ready? What is the most important thing to keep from transmission of diseases? And washing. Oh my gosh. If you would have said anything other fired, you would have been mm -hmm. proper hand hygiene friends. You're going to be asked that 9,000 times. If you miss it, you deserve to miss it. All right, friends, tell me about the sequence for putting on PPE. First off, what does PPE stand for? Protective. Personal protection oh. equipment. Ooh, I'll take it. Personal protective equipment. Cool. And then tell me the order. Hmm. Was it the goggles? The... Like the order that you would actually put it all on? So the goggles, mask, gown, mask, gloves. gown, and gloves. What is it? Mask, gown, and gloves. Mm. Listen, gown, mask, goggles, gloves. Think about it. Gown is the biggest thing you need to put on to protect yourself, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. And then mask, because then you got to protect your mouth. And then your eyes. And then your gloves last, because you want your hands the tidiest before you go in there and start messing with things. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. Gloves are never going to be first. Gloves are going to be first take off. You just reverse the line. Easy enough? Mm -hmm. Okay. Guys, remember how I told you the silly questions of the year? Let's say that I am a patient who has C. diff. And let's say that I have to go help change that patient. And I come in and I put my gloves on and my fingers. What do I need to do? Your fingers what? My finger, it snaps. It snaps out of it. Go get a new glove. Are you sure? Does it start all over? Wash your hands and then get new yeah. gloves. Get new gloves. If you've literally put your finger through a glove and you've already, you've just walked in the door and it's assumed your hands are clean, just get another glove and do it fast, <laughs> right? All right, let's play the math game. Tell me about math. We're going to play the game of rounding. Cool. I'm going to give you a number. 9.5. Oh, this one always annoys everybody. 9.55. Round to the nearest tenth. 9.6. Anybody else? Cool. All right. Let's get a little more hairy. Ready? Patient. As a prescription of 90 pills. Okay. Patient accidentally uses a third of their medication and they drop it in the toilet, like all people with medication do. So, how many pills got dropped into the toilet? 30. 30. 60. They dropped a third. Is that what you said? They dropped a third into the toilet. 30. Everybody got that? Everybody cool? Yeah. Good. Very good. Let's do another one. You want to do another one just to make sure? Yeah. Let's say they have 160 pills. And they lose 50%. You said 50? Yes, ma'am. 80. 80. Oh. Oh. All right, let's do another one. This is a little bit different math. This one's kind of an analogy. 
I have two sodas in my hand. This soda is Sprite. And this soda is, what's the other one? Coke. Pearl. It's got to be two different <laughs> Oh, one sprite, one Sierra Mist. Done. One sprite, one Sierra Mist. And this sprite, I have 20 parts lemon and 50 parts lime. So, and this sprite that's a little bit bigger, this, this bottle is 100 milliliters. Well, this bottle is 50 milliliters. So this 50 milliliter bottle has... 20 parts lemon. How many parts lemon is this 100 milliliter bottle going to have? 40. 40. Chef's kiss. So proud. All right, let's play conversions. Let's do 0 0.12 milligrams. And I want you to convert me to micrograms. For some reason, the littlest pet shop is streaming on YouTube because my kids rule my entire existence. And no. I've, I'm actually become quite engrossed with it. What do you want us to convert it to? I want you to convert milligrams to micrograms. Is it going to be 0 0.012? So is micrograms bigger or smaller than milligrams? Smaller. Smaller. If we're going to the left for smaller, how many over are we going? Is it three? So yeah. anytime we convert from grams to milligrams or milligrams to micrograms, it's always going to be a value of a thousand, which means three spaces or three zeros. Three. Yeah. So it's going to go in sections of three. So it's just a matter of left or right. So it's a matter of seeing who's bigger and who's smaller. So who's bigger, micrograms or milligrams? Milligrams is bigger. Milligrams is bigger, so they go on the left. So now mm. that I know that and I got to go smaller, which way do I need to move my decimal place? To the right. Yeah. So then what's my answer? Um, is um, one is, is 120? Yeah, very good. You see that? I am so lost without, I'm like so lost. Okay, I just got good. so lost. Don't get lost. What you do is you come see me about 10 minutes before class starts. Okay. And we'll do it on the board together. And then I think you're better um, doing things like watching, watching somebody do it. And then you do it and mimic it once and then you're good. So that's why you and I just need to do it on the board, even in my office, maybe 10 minutes before. And then you'll okay. be, is that cool? Yeah. Watch you just don't get me. Okay. You got this. All right, so I think that those are all pretty well contained. Let's do let's do one more. So the first thing we're going to have to do is we're going to have to convert from micrograms to milligrams. And then we need to round, okay? So don't let it freak you out. So let's convert a thousand and fifty micrograms to milligrams. So it's gonna be point one five. What is it? A hundred oh a hundred and five point zero. Or is it just hundred and five? Is it gonna well, be point one five? A thousand micrograms in a milligram, right? Thousand micrograms in a milligram. And so that's one milligram, but you said it's a 1,050. It's 0 0.15, isn't it? It's yes, it's that's that's accurate. So, so what we're going to do is back up. So I gave the number of 1050 micrograms. So where is my decimal place? It's in the front of the one, though. The ma'am. It's at the end of the it's at the Oh, end. what did you say? You said 10.50? I said 1050 micrograms. 1000 micrograms. Mm -hmm. uh, micrograms. Yeah. It's okay. And then convert that to milligrams for me. 
to milligrams. So there's no decimal. You said convert it to milligrams. There's a decimal at the end of the zero. It's always assumed. Remember, it's hidden. We talked about it. It's like a shadow. Right. And what's the answer? So 1.05. 1.05? 1.05. Okay. And then round to the nearest tenth. And what do you get? Um, oh, you well, rounding. We rounding. We're rounding now. We just had to convert. Now we're um, rounding. Is it 1. 1.6? 1. 1.1. 1. 1.1. Very good. Again, I think we should probably all talk about that one on the board. This is one of those things that you are going to do it in front of your face and it's kind of tripping you up because I'm asking really complicated questions kind of last minute. Don't worry about it. We'll do it together. Every time we do it together in front of each other and we answer any questions that we have, we always get it. Right. So we'll just do it again. It's going to be, I have to ask one more time. You said milligrams to, mi you said milligrams to micrograms or micrograms to milligrams. 1,050 micrograms. We're going to convert. Okay. Grams, oh. then round to the nearest tenth. Oh, okay. Yep. All right. Let's get off the of math. Let's go back to stuff we know. Let's get pumped up. We're almost done. Tell me another name for an apical pulse. What's the area that it's located in? The fifth intercostal space. What is it? A point. What P was a PMI? What's the name? What's the name of the area for the, oh, the Is it the fifth intercostal space or is it something else? Over, I'm like over the mitral, over the yes, mitral. Yes, yeah. Oh, okay. I was thinking that, but I'm like, did we say that? Yep. Oh, okay. I told you. I told you this is a beautiful, this is a beautiful rendition and collaborative. Uh, explanation of the last 12 weeks of our existence is it's been really great and i told you that it sounds really simple and you guys are trying to reach far beyond but that's because we were doing med search too we were doing med search one we were already jumping into other things because you guys were already prepared and you were smart so now we're going back to the dumb stuff you're like wait what huh what oh, why, do, why is this so silly this is why because you guys got the hard stuff it's really good i'm excited so uh let's do what is, give me a location of aortic. The second intercostal space. Okay, what side? This right. side, the right. Okay, what's next? The plumondic. Plumondic. What side? The mm -hmm. left, second intercostal space. But what's next? The herb point, point, the third intercostal space. Next. The tricuspid. And oh no, it's not. I, I, this is my happy. Oh, right and the fourth intercostal, and then the mitral. Mitral on the fifth. Okay. Is everyone feeling yeah. good about life right now? Tell me about, um, uh, tell me about uh, respiratory sounds. Let's do, let's do the game of that. Let's play, um, I hear a patient and in their lungs, I hear a popping, bubbling sound. What what does that sound like? Crackles. Crackles. And what type of condition is related to crackles? COPD. Pneumonia. That's a good one. What's my better one that I like to use? CHF. CHF. Now, if I have prominent crackles, is that left-sided or right-sided heart failure? Left side. Oh my God! You should not be able to know that from health assessment. And the crowd, growl, growl, goes, goes, goes. Wild. Sorry, I'm really tired. <laughs> okay, let's get done. Very good. Um, elderly people. What? How do I need to talk to them and communicate with them? What kind of tone do I take with them? What's the expectation with them? A little um, loud. <laughs> loud? No, no, no. no. For elderly, if they can't hear. So if I yell at you and I'm loud, what does that do? It amplifies. It doesn't fix the problem of me not receiving the waveform that you're sending me. So if you calm your tone, like I calm my tone, 
it's much easier to understand me than if I'm over here talking like I'm supposed to be talking because this is what I really sound like and it's a lot more high pitched and it's a lot more ridiculous, right? Like that's how, that's how I actually sound. But I have to lower my tone because it is more universal. Does that make sense? And remember, as you age, what frequency do you have a, a problem with? High frequencies. Yeah, very good. Very good. All right. So, friends, um, I'm, I'm going to be honest with you. You're all going to do very well. Um, let's talk about people who do things improperly very quickly. If I have an STNA who is uh, trying to do something super silly, like they are trying to... I don't know, trying to give someone uh, a temperature or trying to take a, a check in temperature up under someone's armpit while they've been sleeping all night. What would be the expectation for that temperature? If I've been sleeping um, up under blankets all night and I be really high. High. It's gonna be really high. All right, cool. Um, is it a wise idea to use a thermometer for a patient uh, orally when they are blocked up in their sinuses? No. No. Why? I'm not going to get a good reading. Oh my God. They're going to open their mouth because they're congested. Thank you. Like, I know these sound silly, but keep these things in mind because these are the things that we worried about often and it's super silly. Um, <laughs> I don't think I have anything else that you're going to need to go over. I like you guys know way more than you're supposed to. Uh, what's what's what does hepatitis mean? Inflammation. Inflammation. Cool. No, what? Hepa. Liver. Thank you. And then uh, tell me what hypertension is. High blood, uh, high blood pressure. Cool. Oh, cool. Oh. All right. Well, good night. <laughs> I'm going to bed. This is great. Any questions? You going to post this? Girl. <laughs> with my ugly mug with no makeup on, looking like this. A big old fat train wreck. I love I'm you. To say. Of course I am. All right, friends. Okay. Yeah, my line. Go to bed. I will stay awake long enough to take another couple of questions. I, I don't know if it's going to be comprehensible at this point, but I'll try. Go to bed.